I'm guessing so far this year, you've received Christmas cards, right? And those Christmas cards, kind of different shapes, some of them sizes, they have different things on them. Uh, some are cute, others are affectionate. Some might show a winter scene, and others might show candy canes and Christmas trees. And maybe they might show stockings crammed with toys. And yes, we each will probably receive that beautiful card with the Christmas story on it, won't we? That has a nativity scene in it. But maybe it's pen, pen painted, maybe it's etched. And on that card, <laughs> you'll see inside maybe a stable, the oxen, and sheep and shepherds leaning on their staffs. Some will maybe even have the wise men from the east and angels hovering over them with trumpets. And at the center, you'll always see what? Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus in the manger. And the baby Jesus is wrapped in cloth. And he also has usually a halo over his head, right? And the reality is, we cherish that story, don't we? And some of the cards, we've received quite a few cards this Christmas. And some of the cards we get, I want to know where you get your cards. Because some of the cards are just gorgeous, they're just beautiful. And we really do cherish the stories that those cards tell. And the panorama that it makes is very vivid for us. But it also makes me wonder I wonder if those of us who encounter Christmas this way, year in and year out, if we see and hear the message, as fresh as that card is that came to us this year, is the message that we're getting as fresh. And I hope in 2020 we would see it all afresh. If we really open ourselves to receive the Christ Jesus announced by our cards and our carols that we sing. And now we're going to sing here Thursday night at the Christmas Eve service. And by candlelight. I hope we would realize just how precious that gift is, which God has given. And it's a gift that God has given, and it's a gift that is desperately needed. But do we? Do we receive it? You see, we love the manger scene. We really do. We all do. Believers and probably non believers alike love the manger scene of baby Jesus. But when he becomes the man, Jesus the Christ, and says, Repent, for the kingdom is here, I think the view of him changes that. And the reason why I'm asking this or even saying this this morning is because that's what the Gospel of John, chapter 1, talks about. It includes very striking mentions of what happened on that first Christmas. The meaning of Jesus Christ, which I think we can sometimes forget. In John chapter 1, beginning at verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You've heard me say it, and I'm going to say it again today. Not everybody is a child of God. Everybody, all of humanity, since the inception back in Genesis, all the way through when Christ returns and everything in God's plan is done, every human being is created in the image of God. We're his image bearers. But according to what we just read, it's through faith in Jesus Christ that we have the right to become a child of God. And see, when you start studying the Gospels, each of the Gospels presents Christ in a different picture. 
As I heard uh, Charles Swindoll say many, many years ago, he said, when you read the Gospels, it would be just like if I gave you each a camera and say, now go and Cape May and take the pictures of what you want, and we bring them all back together, we're all going to have different pictures. There's going to be some similarities, but you're going to look at it from a different angle. And that's what the Gospels do. They all share a message. Matthew emphasizes his kingship, that he's king. Mark emphasizes his servanthood. John looks at the powerful presentation of Christ as the great creator God of the universe. And Luke looks at his manhood. So John looks at it in a different light. And his vision of Christ has been used countless times to open the eyes of a non-believer. Just read the first chapter, first verse in John 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a powerful picture. And it says that the world, though, did not know or accept him. Why not? The Christmas story for all its beautiful cards and accolades and lovely aesthetic decorations and gorgeous music this time of the year provokes a crisis, I think, of recognition. Anybody have an idea what the world population is right now? 7.3 billion. That's the current world population. And roughly one-third of that population, they say, are Christian. Really? One-third of 7.3 billion people, which is roughly what? 2.5 billion people are Christian. Look at how broken our world is. I think there's a recognition issue. Because if that's true, why does our world, our country, our state, our county, our city, our homes continue to push God out, to disobey God? I remember years ago in a midweek Bible study, a young lady made the statement, God will not ask me to go outside my comfort zone. Yeah, I'm sorry. A lot of us struggle. But she was serious. She said, God will never ask me to go outside my comfort zone. I can tell you since I got into full-time pastoral ministry, it's when I get outside my comfort zone where God really uses me. And that's where I really grow, really. Truth be told, most of us hope for a Savior is not what we get. I believe that we look for and what we expect is what we want in a Christ, small c, frequently binds us and runs into issues with Christ, the big c. He came to his own, but his own people did not accept him. The Word became flesh comes to us as a stranger. It comes to us as an outsider, as one with no place. Even Jesus said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. For all practicality, he says, I'm homeless. And yet he seeks a home amongst us, but he cannot find it. And the way he came into this world, he was homeless. And yet God knew his son would be rejected. And yet, he still gave the greatest gift that's ever been given in history. You see, the Gospels illustrate from the very beginning that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, there was going to be no acceptance. There was going to be no security. There was going to be no home. In fact, Luke referenced that. 
to which he tells very bluntly in Luke 2, 7, that Jesus comes into the world in a stable. Why? Because there was no room in the inn. And they didn't even try to make room in the inn for a pregnant lady. And Matthew offers an even more vivid account, that narrative we read last week, about the Magi coming. They're following the star, their arrival at the home, they offer gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which are the gifts that you give to a king. And it comes contained in a story, though, telling of Herod's outright rejection and desire to kill that Messiah. If we would have read more of the story last week, we would have heard that. They went to, he went to them and said, hey, once you figure out where he's at, why don't you come tell me? Because I want to go worship him too. Though that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to kill him. Why? Because he felt threatened by it. And yet, it was the shepherds and strangers from a foreign land who sought him out. It wasn't his own. They didn't seek him out, even though he was right there. And after the visit, the family needs to flee the country. Can you imagine that? You just gave birth to a child, and now you've got to flee because there's somebody that wants to kill your child? Folks, this is part of the Christmas story. But yet, that's how Jesus spent his first years of his life. On the run, homeless. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. He knew that. He knew that's what was going to happen. And yet, he still gave us the greatest gift ever. But guess what? It doesn't stop there, does it? Because after the Lord's birth, his life and his ministry, he engaged them with what? Parables, stories. And for instance, he comforts us with the way we should look at a world, a world that is so different. To having that kingdom view, a view of how God looks at the world. A world so different with self-identity and the great greed it nourishes and encourages a world so different as to virtually is unrecognizable really from the scripture sometimes and yet jesus tells the parable of the good samaritan in luke 10 and they ask him that question well who's my neighbor they were convinced that the neighbor would be what well it would be like them would look like them act like them and what neighbor does Jesus give them? A Samaritan comes and saves that insider lying in the ditch with those who look like the insider. The parable falls on stunned, disbelieving ears, unable to embrace the saving truth. Again, God knew this, and yet he still gave the greatest gift ever to him. And Jesus goes and makes friends with what his own people considered social outcasts. Extortionists, disabled, mentally ill, untouchable. And because Jesus did that, then what happens? It kicks in a special committee on unorthodox and anti-Roman activities. In other words, they put a church committee together. And what's the verdict? Death to the blasphemer. We need to kill him. <clears throat> he came to what was his own. He was unrecognized. He was driven into a far country, refused a home. And yet, because God so loved the world, that he still gave us that perfect gift. Even though he knew it's going to be rejected. See, again, I think we have this misconception. We want to keep him in the manger as a baby because that's easy. 
But when he becomes a man, he says, you need to repent. Because God's kingdom is near. Ooh, that gets a horror. And again, like we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was light, and the light was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So it makes me ask the question. Does John's observation strike a note with us? Does it really strike a chord? Whom do we expect at Christmas? Whom do we expect when he returns? When he returns, will he find you as an enemy or a friend? As Jesus said, will I find them faithful when he returns? And the reality is, it's your choice. It's our choice. What do we want at Christmas? Do we want that insider, someone who speaks our language, responds to our hopes and feeds our dreams? Someone who recognizes our own as our own and a friend we'd invite over for cider and Christmas cookies? The reality is, Jesus the Christ who offers salvation, that Christ, born outside the inn, an animal in your heart. I don't know if you've ever been in a barn with animal manure. I've been literally submerged in it. It doesn't smell nice. And it doesn't taste good either. <laughs> But that Christ who began with his life clean for his life across the border, this Christ who made the heroic, hated foreign Samaritan the good neighbor, this Christ is saying, if anyone desires to come after me, he says, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This Christ, this Jesus of Christ was beaten. He was bloody. And he was hanging on that cross outside the city walls. And that Christmas time, he comes to this world. He comes to his own. He comes to this country. He comes to this state. He comes to this city. He comes to this church. He comes to your life. He comes into your home. And he dies. Because he wants a hold in our heart. In verses 12 and 13, he says, But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who will believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. you got to believe. Believe in John. Believe throughout Scripture is a verb. A verb means action. It requires you to do something. I like the illustration that came across by J. Vernon McGee when it says that you must believe into, in, or upon Jesus Christ. And he illustrated it like this. He said that if you're standing beside a chair, and beside that chair, you believe that that chair will hold you. He said, you only have a head knowledge. Why? Because you have only believed that it will hold you. It becomes real belief once you do what? You sit in the chair. And it holds you. That's belief. It becomes real because you sat in that chair. Have you trusted him? Have you believed in him? Are you resting in him? That's the gift that God's offering. Are you, as Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
Are you denying yourself? Are you picking up your cross and are you following Christ? No matter the consequences. The challenge for us and before us is to create an open heart where Jesus Christ can be at home in us. And then because he's at home with us, to go share that good news. <clears throat> Are we willing to live it out just as Jesus Christ did? Even though he was rejected, he was persecuted when it happened. I read an article, came across it here earlier this week. And it's, the title of it is The Persecution of a Finnish Parliamentarian. And I just want to read a little excerpt from it. It says, on August 25th, Finnish member of parliament, Avi Rosanen, was summoned to a police station in Helsinki at 10 a.m. 10 Thereafter, she was interrogated by police officers on suspicion of agitation against a minority a crime for which, if found guilty, she would receive up to two years imprisonment. This fall, Rosnan told the register, this is the third time I'm being interrogate, interrogated on suspicious suspicion of agitation against a minority group. Although the interrogations and the statements related to them take up my time, I will not back down from my views. So, what are the views that warranted her ongoing criminal investigation? They have to do with whether or not it is legal to publicly confess and teach Bible-based views on man's relationship with God. And what pursued it? What caused it to really kick in? Back in December 20, 2019, so a year ago, this lady is still dealing with this. She went on a talk show, and the question was asked of the panel, what would Jesus think about homosexuals? And during the show, Rosman discussed the Bible's teaching on the incarnation, creation, sin, last judgment, and salvation. As she explained to the register, I emphasize that all men, regardless of their sexual orientation, are on the same line before God. All valuable, but also all sinful, and in need of Jesus' redemption work in order to inherit eternal life. It is inconceivable for me that what I have said in the program is suspected of being defamatory in any part. But that's what was happening to her. And it's even happening here. It's even happening in this church. But, he says, the greatest of Christ's love comes from the Father. John concludes in verse 18, he says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, he has made him known. So Jesus the Christ is the explanation. And the fancy little term for that is what we call exegesis. It's the explanation of who God is. You want to know who God is? Look to Jesus Christ. The greatness of Christ explains the greatness of the Father. The greatness of Christ's love explains the greatness of the Father's love. And the greatness of Christ's grace explains the greatness of the Father's grace. So in other words, to receive Christ, who is the Word of God, needs to acknowledge who He is and His claim. And you place your faith in Him. You trust Him, and thereby you also yield your allegiance to Him. Martin Luther said it this way. He said, Oh, dearest Jesus, holy child, 
Make me a bed, soft and undefiled within my heart. That it may be a quiet chamber kept for thee, my heart for very joy doth leap. My lips no more can silence keep. I too must sing with joyful tongue that sweetest ancient cradle song, Glory to God in the highest heaven, who unto men his Son has given. While angels sing with pious mirth, a glad new year to all the earth. God the giver. He knew his son was going to be rejected. He knew it. Yet, he still gave his only begotten son for us. Our Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you so much that you show us your love through the birth of the miraculous conception and miraculous miracle of the birth of your Son, our Savior and Lord. But Father, do you think sometimes the conception we have of that baby in the manger is not the real Christ the man who calls us to repent? So Father, stir in our hearts. Make your word, the living word, and especially the written word, alive. And as Paul says to remind us that to be transformed is to be transformed in the renewing of our mind. That we would spend time in your word, especially this time of year, but not just this time of year, but every day, Father. Especially as we draw closer and closer and closer to the day your son returns. And Father, may our thoughts and may our words and may our deeds be glorified to you. And Father, that you would find us faithful on that day that you return. And we ask this in the blessed name of the crucified. Amen.